Greetings and blessings to you. Happy Wednesday. Glad you're tuning in with us, uh, getting a chance to go through the Word of God together. We need the Word of God just like we need regular food. And uh, we don't go days without eating. We should not go many days without hearing a thought or hearing something from the Word of God that can touch us. And today I want to talk to you about heart health. I want to talk about heart health. I'm not talking about your physical heart. We're not going to be talking about cholesterol. We're not talking about exercising. We're not talking about eating right. We're not talking about staying away from Popeyes and churches more than every now and then. And I love Popeyes and been to churches in a long time. But either way, I digress. But we are talking about your spiritual heart, your inner man, and how your spiritual heart and your inner man needs to be kept incredibly healthy. So do me a favor, invite somebody into the stream, share it, uh, like it if you're there, subscribe if you see that button there on YouTube or whatever you might be watching on. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the very issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the very issues of life. Who we are comes out of the heart. Who we are comes out of our inner man. You can't be something inside and it not manifest at some point outside. That word keep is the word nasar. A nasau is kind of how it's pronounced. It means to watch, to watch, to look out for. That's what that word actually means. And then diligence is the word mismar. It literally means to guard, to confine, to lock down, to imprison. The Bible is saying, take your heart and lock it down. Guard it, confine it. Don't let it run wild. Don't let it get captivated by something that God is not pleased with. Don't let it uh, imprison you in some way. And you know, your heart can mess you up, man. If you let your heart get on some stuff that God is not interested in, it'll get there. It'll, it'll, it'll confine you, lock you down. But God said, here's what I want you to do. You be the guard of your heart. You be the sentry to your heart. You be the one that stands at the gate of your heart and you decide what gets in your heart to impact it and what doesn't. Now that's very interesting because a lot of people think we don't control what happens with our heart. We just feel what we feel when we feel what we feel and we like what we feel or we don't like what we feel, but it's not that way. You are literally in control. You are the gatekeeper of your heart. You're the one that decides what comes in, what doesn't come in. So the Bible's saying, keep your heart, guard your heart, make sure you stand, watch for your heart, and don't let those negative emotions of bitterness and anger and wrath and malice and uh, our lust or pride or arrogance or whatever those things are that would want to knock at your heart, don't you let them in there because if you do, you'll manifest that. There's no way you can be have something dominant in your heart and it not come out at some point in your life. Now, heart value is something that we have to concern ourselves with as believers. There's real value in keeping your heart healthy. Why? Because as you are, your heart is. Or as your heart is, you are. Or as you are, your heart is, or as your heart is, you are. Where do we get that from? Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. As he thinks in his heart, and you've heard that for years, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That is reality, my friends. That is true. As a person thinks in their heart, so are we. We are a summation of our thoughts. We're a summation of our meditation. We're a summation of our history. The things that have happened to us that have passed through our mind, the things that are currently passing through our mind, and the things we meditate on, that determines who we are. That's really who we are. So if you want to keep your life right, keep your and heart and mind, they really kind of go together in the Word of God. We're talking about your inner life, your heart, your mind, your emotions, your meditations, your thoughts. All of that is what we speak of when we speak of heart. And the Word of God says we have to keep it with all diligence because the very issues of life, the very concepts of life come out of what we allow in our heart. Now, true words come from your heart. You ever read this verse that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Out of the abundance of what's in your heart, your mouth is going to say. It's kind of like a if you took a basketball and tried to push it down under water, you can hold it down for a while, but eventually it's going to pop up. Same thing about what's in your heart. What's in your heart will eventually come out of your mouth. You ever been in a place you spoke something and you wish you didn't speak it? And, and the thing that you really regret is that you said it, but you said it because you felt it. You said it because it was in your heart. You said it because it was there. Have there been times the Holy Spirit tried to restrain you from saying something? Don't say it. Don't say it. Be quiet. And out of the abundance of your heart, it just came out like a volcano and it shut your marriage down for two weeks. Ever had things like that happen for you before? Something that caused you problems at work? Listen, 
It came out of the abundance of the heart. That's what we have to realize. Those things don't just come arbitrarily. Sometimes we may just yield to a thought from the enemy, or sometimes there may be you know, a concept that somebody says is, is an, in a very impulsive way, but a lot of times these things issue from our heart. So if you want to change the outside, you must change the inside. Change what's happening with your heart. We act from the heart. Actions actually come from the heart. Acts chapter 5, we see that very clearly after Ananias and Sapphira actually lied to the Holy Spirit, lied to the brethren. And here's what Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Now, the story here is where people were giving money to the church and Ananias and Sapphira sold some land. Let's say they sold the land for $5 million. Oh yeah, like high price land. $5 $5 million. And then they came and brought $2.5 million to the church and said, here, here's the entire price of the land. The land was worth this. We sold it. Now, it was their land. They didn't have to lie, but they wanted themselves to look bigger than they were. And Peter said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So here's what happened. Satan touched their heart, attacked their heart. And out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth spoke and they ended up releasing a lie. Our actions come out of our heart. Our mouth speaks out of our heart. We, my friends, have to get our heart right. Faith comes from our heart. It really does. Romans 10, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So if your heart's messed up, it could affect your salvation, beloved. It really can. Mark 11, the classic verse in Mark 11, 23 and 24, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And here it is, and does not doubt in his, come on, faith is affected by what's in your heart, but believes those things which he says will be done. He will have whatever he says, but it depends on whether it's in the heart or not. My friends, we got to get our heart right. If our mouth comes from our heart, if our actions come from our heart, if faith comes from our heart, if the issues of life come out of our heart, we must get our heart in good shape. We have to have the right inner reality, the right inner life. Our heart has to be the way God wants it to be. So I want to talk to you for a few mementos. I'm not going to be long, so I want you to listen good on how to have a good heart. You want to know how to keep your heart healthy? You want to know how to have a good heart? You want to know how your heart can be everything God wants it to be? Well, I'm going to tell you, number one, and I'm going to primarily dwell on this point because it's so important, cultivate a tender heart. A tender heart is one of the most beautiful heart dispositions you can ever have. It is phenomenal. It is like God. God's heart is tender. His heart is mild. In fact, Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. I'm kind and gentle. My heart is tender and you will find rest to your souls. I love that verse, but I love it even more when we begin to cultivate a heart that is tender. First Peter chapter three, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brothers, be, here it is, tender hearted, be courteous, have a tender heart, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, are reveling for reveling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Man, the Bible says we should be tender-hearted, kind, compassionate, loving. That's the heart we need to cultivate. Ephesians 4 says, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Okay, so you young lady, you want to choose a husband kind of husband you want? What kind of man you want? Let's say you're not married and you get to just pick him, hand pick him. What kind of heart will you give him? Don't tell me you won't give him a tender heart. Yeah, you want him manly. Yeah, you want him strong, but you want his heart to be compassionate. You want him to be the kind of man that if you have a bad day and you mess up, that he's tender towards you. He has mercy towards you. And that's the way God is toward us. And the same thing, a man with a woman. If you want to choose a wife, sir, you want to choose a, a lady to be with the rest of your life? What kind of lady you want? One, one that's mean and hard-hearted and never forgives and holds grudge? No, you want one that has a tender heart. And I'm going to tell you, God also values a tender heart. People value a tender heart. A tender heart 
will cause your career to skyrocket. A tender heart will cause your relationships to be strong. A tender heart will cause your relationship with God to go to a new level. A tender heart is one that's compassionate. And that word in the Bible is like healthy bowels, one that has empathy, one that can feel, one whose heart is not, it's not hard. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, but one whose heart is tender. So here's what we have to do. We have to plant the right seeds in our heart so that our heart can be tender. Seeds of unity, seeds of love, seeds of kindness, seeds of courtesy, seeds of forgiveness. These are the seeds we need to plant. Seeds not of division, not of fighting all the time, not of fussing all the time, not of yelling all the time, not of throwing stuff in the house, not of cursing each other out and then getting on your knees trying to repent and say, Lord, I'm so sorry, but you did it again last Tuesday. I, let God do something in your heart. Let's bring greater unity, greater love. And love is not a feeling, it's a verb, it's what you do. How about kindness? How about courtesy? How about forgiveness? These are the things we have to plant inside of our heart. And as we plant them inside of our heart, we will begin to reap the right seeds. Your heart is tender. Let me give you some ideas when your heart is tender. Your heart is tender when you are quick to repent. So repent quickly. How do you know when your heart's tender? Your heart's tender when you're quick to repent. So repent quickly. What does repent mean? It means to say, I'm sorry. It means to acknowledge you're wrong. It means to humble yourself to the point where you understand that you're wrong, that you've messed up. You say it to God, you say it to others. Your, your heart is tender when you quickly repent, and God honors that. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 11, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. And then um, because his heart was tender, God said, And you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place, and against the inhabitants of this land, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And, it, and you tore your clothes and you wept before me. Also, God says, I have heard you, says the Lord. And surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your fathers in peace. And your eyes shall not see the calamity that I decided to bring upon these people. So they brought word back to the king. So here's what happened. Israel for a long time had no law, had no Bible had no Torah to read, so they didn't really know how to live and how not to live. And they were worshiping other gods, and they were in idolatry, and they were, they were living wildly. And somebody went and found a book of the law in the temple and brought it to the king and said, King, we found a book of the law. And the king said, read it to me. And as they began reading it, they began to read all the curses and all the judgment that will come upon Israel if they disobeyed. And when the king read it, instead of saying, wow, man, we didn't know. And, you know, my bad, my bad. You know, what, what had happened was, instead of saying that, he tore his clothes and wept. And God sent word by the prophet and said, tell him because his heart was tender. Because he responded with tenderness. Because he responded with a yielded heart. Go back and tell him that I'm going to, I have to do this, but I'm not going to bring it upon his day. He and his sons and his family are going to die in peace. So I'm going to bring the calamity, but because his heart was tender, I'll spare him from calamity. And you know what? A tender heart can spare you from a lot of calamity, a lot of trouble. So we need to repent with God. Whenever we mess up, don't just say, ah, grace will cover it. Ah, it's going to be all right. God understands. Boys will be boys. Girls will be girls. One but a little thing I did. I, I, didn't, I could have punched him, but I just slapped him. I, I said a curse, but it was one of them, them mild curses. It wasn't one of them deep curses. So ah, it's going to be. No, no, listen. Repent to God when you do something wrong. Whatever it might be. I just use a couple of silly examples. We're having fun here, but whatever it might be. And some of the things we do to God are not fun. They're not funny. Some of the ways we sin, and the Bible makes it very clear that there are standards of right and wrong. And whenever that happens, do not just be quick to repent. Now, it's not good to have a mindset, I'm just going to do this and repent later. That's not what I'm talking about. When you mess up, when, when humanity catches up with you to a certain extent, quickly, God, I'm sorry. Jesus told us to pray every day, Lord, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins, as we forgive others who have trespassed against us. Be quick to acknowledge, for God already knows what's up with us. We don't have to act like we're better than we are. We need to consistently repent before him. Not only with God, with other people. When you mess up with your children, tell them you're sorry. When you mess up with your wife, your husband, tell them you're sorry. When you mess up at work, tell them you're sorry. Those words, I'm sorry, my bad, forgive me. Those are words that are key relational constructive words, relationally constructive words. And you also need to be tenderhearted with yourself. 
There are a lot of people that are too hard on themselves. I'm speaking to somebody now. Your problem is you're too hard on yourself. You're merciful with others, but you're hard on yourself. When you mess up, you don't forgive yourself. You ought to be tenderhearted toward you as well as toward others and as well as with God. Talking about being tenderhearted. Now, your heart is also tender when you're concerned about others. Your heart is also tender when you're concerned about others. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I, I, I love that verse. I'm going to read it again. We're not finished with it. But let nothing be done through striving, selfish ambition, conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each person esteem others better than you are. Let each of you look not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. You have a tender heart when you care about other people. The Bible says, don't look on your own things, look on the things of others. Let every man not just be consumed with selfishness, just about me and my, look on the things of others. Whose life have you made a difference in lately? Who do you minister to? Who gets the benefit of your love? Who gets the benefit of your charity? Who gets the benefit of your prayers? Don't only look on your own things, look on the things of others. You have a tender heart when you care, when you care about what's happening to other people, when you care about the misfortunes of other people, when you care about uh, the pain and the hurt that others are going through. Uh, the Bible says when, you're, when your brother weeps, weep with him. When he rejoices, rejoice with him. There's an empathy that we're called to exhibit as believers where we care about others and we deeply enter into either the pain or pleasure of others. And that's an empathetic way. And you can't do that if you, if you don't have a tender heart. So you have a tender heart when you care about others, but you also have a tender heart when you humble yourself. You have a tender heart when you humble yourself. Proverbs 13, 10 Another one of my favorite verses says, by pride comes nothing but strife. By pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well advised is wisdom. If there's a lot of strife in a relationship, there's pride somewhere. Who has the pride? I'm not saying, but if there is strife in relationships, there is pride somewhere. I remember years ago reading a book by Dr. Seuss, and he had these Zacks. I think he called them Zacks. Sometimes they were called Geeches in some people's mind. But they were these little creatures that Dr. Seuss made up. And there was one particular book where there was a northbound Zack and a southbound Zack. And the northbound Zack could only go north and the southbound one could only go south. And the, the book starts out with the north one going north up the hills around the, up, up, up the hills and down and moving. And the south one up the hills down moving. Then all of a sudden they meet, but the place they meet in is very narrow. It's somewhat narrow, so they meet and they exchange pleasantries and, hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? And they talk, and when they finish talking, then the north one said to the south, would you please move out of the way so I can pass by you? But the south one said, no, I will not move out of the way, because if I move out of the way, I'll no longer be going south. I'll then be going east or west. You move out of the way so I can pass by you. No, I will no longer move out of the way because I won't be going north. I'll be going east or west. And they argued for the rest of the book. And then life grew around them, roads grew around them, cities grew around them, communities grew around them, and they're still standing there with their arms folded, stubborn, not going anywhere because of pride. And I always think about that when I read Proverbs 13, 10, because some people are so proud they never go anywhere. Their relationships suffer. They get to a point of standstill because you don't humble yourself. Sometimes relationships are 70, 30. Sometimes they are 50-50, but sometimes they're 100 nothing. Sometimes they're 90-10. You do what it takes to make relationships work. It's called humility, and you have a tender heart when you're able to humble yourself, when you're able to say you're wrong. Listen, even when you're right, there's nothing wrong with saying I'm sorry if it will bring greater unity. There have been several times in my life. Now, there have been many times I did not respond right, and many times I reacted in pride, but there have been many times in my life that I diffused situations by humbling myself to a degree that was very uncomfortable for me. I didn't like it. I wanted to go off on somebody, but I said, I'm sorry. I humbled myself as a result. And there are many times I didn't do it, but there are many times I do it. And the more I do it, the more I want to do it because the fruit of humility is wonderful. You know you have a tender heart when you're able to humble yourself. And somebody I'm talking to, I feel that. Your problem is that you're, you don't like humbling yourself. And God's trying to get you to a place of humbling yourself. You know, my daughter had a dream. I'll never forget this dream. She had a dream that, w that my family at that time, this was many years ago, my family was, was like going through a military obstacle course. 
you know, how you jump over a wall and you swing on a rope and you see these military obstacle courses. But she got to a particular place, or all of us got to a place, where we had to crawl under some barbed wire and in the mud. So our whole family's crawling under barbed wire in the mud. And as we're crawling under barbed wire in the mud, there are bullets that are flying over the top of the barbed wire. And a voice spoke in the dream and said, stay low so you don't get shot. What a dream. You know, sometimes the enemy has access to us because we raise our head in pride. Only by pride comes contention, but also before pride, before destruction comes pride. The Bible says that clearly, that pride leads to destruction and a haughty spirit leads to a fall. So humility is the way to stay. Humility is the way to keep ourselves in God. And you have a tender heart when you're able to humble yourself. And humbling yourself is is a choice. It's not a feeling. You just decide to do it. I could carry on, but I'm not going to carry on. I could argue, I'm not going to argue. I could go off on them, I'm not going to go off on them. I'm just going to apologize. I'm going to appease the relationship. Now, sometimes you have to deal with things. That that doesn't mean you don't ever deal with things. Sometimes things have to be brought to the table. Sometimes conflict is a greater way to a stepping stone to greater unity, but you can humble yourself by how you do it. In conflict, you don't have to accuse the other person. You could accuse yourself. Say, you know what? I'm not doing a good job in this relationship, and I really want to do better. And I want you to help me to see the ways you think I can do better. When I act like this, how does this make you feel? You see what you did? You humbled yourself. You put it on yourself instead of you always and you this and you and you and you, you said I. And that is a form of humility. So I'm not saying you don't deal with things. Deal with them. But deal with them in a place of humility. Whenever you have to uh, confront a superior, do it with great respect, my friend. Go to them and with great respect and thank them for the good things they're doing and honor them for their position and say, you know, I have something that I feel like wouldn't be honest and sincere if I don't bring it to you. Would you mind if I shared my heart with you for a minute? You're very respectful and you say things in a way that hopefully it can be redemptive instead of going off or just going to the break room and talking about your boss and just doing it the wrong way that causes conflict in the office and could cost you your job. Humility, fairness. These are ways that we, my friends, can humble ourselves and keep pride out of our heart. So, if we're going to do this, we have to not only plant the good seeds, but we have to weed out the bad seeds. And one of the bad seeds, if you want a tender heart, is hardness of heart. Now, how do you know when your heart is hard? Your heart is hard when you don't care. So care. You have a hard heart when you don't care. So care. You have a hard heart when you don't care. So care. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. And Jesus entered the synagogue again. There was a man there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. When he had looked around on them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Look how hard their heart was. Pharisees, Sadducees, Sabbath day. Got a man who has a withered hand. May have been with it all of his life. Can't stretch it out, can't use it. He's deformed. And you got a healer who's in the place. And they're concerned about a silly law. And it's, it's not that the, the law was silly from God. The way they interpreted the law was so legalistic and so strict. They said, no, you can't be healed today. Well, Jesus is going to be in another village tomorrow. He can't heal him tomorrow. He'll be gone. So you want the man to stay deformed the rest of his life rather than honor the day. But here's more. what's more hypocritical. Jesus said, there's not one of you that will loose his ox or loose his donkey on that day or do something like that on the Sabbath day. And here's a man who has a withered hand. The problem was they didn't care. Their heart was so hard. They became so legalistic. And we have to be careful not to do that. They were so into um, uh, standards and realities. We don't care about people. Jesus balanced both of those. He was able to care about reality and standards, yet care about people. He says to the woman caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more, but I'm not going to condemn you. He was able to balance those two in a unique way. And we have to begin to do the same thing. We can't let our hearts be hard to the point we don't care, care about people, care about those that have less than we do, care about those that are hurting, care about those that are down, care about those that are messed up in life. We can't just live on this side of the tracks and not care about those on this side. We can't just live on this 
this side and hate those who live on that side. We have to be people that care. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of other people and begin to demonstrate the very kindness and the very compassion of God. And when we don't do that, our heart is hard. It's hard. Your heart is hard when you're stubborn. Stubbornness is sign of a hardened heart. Exodus chapter 4, that was Pharaoh's problem. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, I know the Bible says God hardened his heart, but let's, let's look at what a hardened heart looks like. I'm not speaking of the theological premise that God is God and he can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. That's what Romans says. God is God. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? God is God. But I'm not addressing that right now. I just want to show you what hardness looks like. Hardness looks like Pharaoh watching Egypt destroyed. Hardness looks like Pharaoh watching the fact that God really does want his people go to go. Water turns to blood. Flies cover the land. Frogs cover the land. Dust becomes boils upon man and upon beast. I mean, it's obvious there's some supernatural power at work here. It's obvious that something is going on. It's obvious that God's in it, but you keep hardening your heart. You keep on saying no. You keep on digging down. You keep on being stubborn. And I'm telling you, some of you, your relationships are struggling because you're too stubborn. You're too stubborn. Who told you stubbornness was a good trait? Oh, stubbornness is a good trait when you fight against the enemy. You fight against Satan, I'm talking about. Stubbornness is a good tra trait if it keeps you from quitting when you're doing something, try to get better. But it is not a good trait with relational equity and, and creative. It is not. Stubbornness caused the entirety of Egypt to be destroyed because Pharaoh kept hardening his heart, kept being stubborn. So I'm, not, I'm not letting them people go. And there are little things that God's knocking at the door of your heart about. Say, hey, let this go. Come on. You, no, no, you're doing too much of that. It's too much entertainment. Let it go. No, no. You know this relationship is not right. What are you doing? You know it's not right. I've spoken to you over and over again. Come on, let it go. I'm stuck. I'm not going to. Whatever God speaks to you, listen, obey him. Don't let stubbornness cause the hardness of your heart to negatively affect you. Huh? Some marriages are being destroyed because of that. Some kids... Some people are watching their kids disintegrate based on your behavior or your lack of attention toward them, yet we keep hardening our heart over and over again. Some people, God deals with you about things and you harden your heart over and over again. I don't want a stubborn heart. I want a tender heart, something we should pray for on a regular basis. Say, God, keep my heart tender. Don't let it be stubborn. Let it be pliable. Let it be moldable. In fact, let's pray that right now. Say, Lord Jesus, come on, say it with me. Lord Jesus, keep my heart pliable. Keep it moldable. Keep my heart pliable and moldable, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, here's another evidence of a hard heart. Your heart is hard when you're not thankful. When you're not thankful. That's why the scripture says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in a day of trial. In the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and tried me, and they saw my works for 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. And I said unto the people, you go astray in your hearts and you do not know my ways. You know, God was just dealing with them, talking to them. So he said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Man, our hearts are hardened so many times. We have to watch out for it because a hard heart is a path to destruction. When your heart gets hard, you end up being destroyed just like Pharaoh did in Egypt. And a hard heart can actually hinder your destiny. Psalm 95 verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in a rebellion as in a day of the wilderness. It goes on and says, when your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my work these 40 years, how he was grieved with that generation. We read that verse earlier because that verse is so important. It needs to be repeated because they were destroyed out of stubbornness. Think about the children of Israel in the wilderness, how over and over again, because of a hard heart, they missed the promised land. They lost the promised land. They did not make it to the promised land because their heart was stubborn and hard. We're talking about heart health. For some reason, God laid on my heart to bring to you and to me that we need to cultivate a tender heart and by all means reject a hardened heart. That we don't need to allow stubbornness in our heart, pride. We don't need to allow an uncaring dimension in our heart, but instead we need to quickly forgive. We need to let things go. 
We need to walk in kindness, walk in compassion. We have to cultivate that. And, and when you look at the word, the word is, so how do you do that? How not do the way you do it is you just do it. We keep waiting on feelings for things to happen. But if you're waiting on feelings, there'll be so many things that you won't do. Feelings follow actions, not the other way around. You start acting in forgiving ways, and soon you'll feel the forgiveness pop up. You act in love, and soon you'll feel the love begin to pop up. And that's what God commands us to do. It's what he's asking us to do. So my friends, I hope your heart is good. I hope your natural heart is good. I hope your blood pressure is good. Keep it good. Hope you don't have high cholesterol. Keep it low. But I hope your spirit, your heart is good because out of your heart flow all the issues of life. So we have to guard it. We have to keep it with all diligence. So if you took inventory of your heart right now, what would you find in there that needs to be purged out? Where are the rocks? Where are the pebbles? Where are the weeds that need to be weeded out? And cultivate kindness, compassion, mercy, tenderness, forgiveness. And you know whether or not you're walking in hardness or tenderness based on the quality of your relationships. We always blame relational issues on other people, but sometimes it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Sometimes it might be us. Sometimes it might be the other person. I give it to that. They, their heart might be hard and yours might be pliable, but we're talking to you right now. I'm not talking to them because they're not watching this. And if they are watching this, I'm talking to both of you. But right now I'm talking to you. I want to know how much hardness is in me. I want God to dissect me. I want God to divest my heart. I want God to begin to reveal what's in my heart. I want God to begin to show me what's in my heart. Then I can get it right. And then I can begin walking with a heart that's more tender. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it flow the very issues of life. Amen. And if you have never given your life to Christ, that's where it all starts. That's where he begins to put a spirit in you. He said in the word, I'll take the heart of stone out of you and I'll give you a heart of flesh or a tender heart. It starts by the Holy Spirit living in us. That's when God begins to soften your heart. That happened to me after I gave my life to Christ. God came in and began to soften and work on my heart in ways and deliver me from ways. And I'm still being uh, helped and made more like him daily. Hopefully I am. I got to ask my wife about that, but I think I am. But he can do the same thing for you. You ought to invite him in. You ought to make him the king, the boss. You ought to run with him. I'm telling you, he's good. He's good. Oh, 33 years I've been running with him. And he is good. He's never done me harm, never done me wrong. He wants to do the same to you. He's the bridge to eternal life. When I die, I want to make sure I go the right direction. He's the bridge that gets me there. But more importantly, I want him because I want to live, not die. I want to live. And I don't want to live without him. So pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sin. Teach me to live the way you want me to live. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey friend, I love you. God bless you. I thank God for you. If this blessed you in any way, do me a favor, SLS. Would you SLS for me? Oh, come on, please just SLS for me. What is that? Share, share the stream, like it. If you're on a platform that allows you to like it or subscribe. If you're on a platform that allows you to subscribe, SLS. It'll be a great blessing to somebody else. Be a media missionary, share the love so somebody else can have a tender heart. God bless you, I love you so much. Hey, we'll see you soon. Stand by for a couple of announcements of ways you could be a blessing and a couple of things that are upcoming. Take care. Now, there are multiple ways that you can stay connected here at Fresh Anointing House of Worship in new and exciting ways. We have a brand new website and app that just launched. Don't forget to check out fayhow.org and download the Fayhow app. All you have to do is search F-A-H-O-W in your Apple Store or Google Play. It is the perfect way to stay connected and up to date on all things going on at Fresh. You can live stream our services, watch previous sermons, and you'll have access to sermon notes and more. There are multiple ways to give here at Fresh Anointing House of Worship. One of those ways is online on our new website, fayhow.org. Just click the Give tab at the top of the homepage. Once there, you will put in your information and verify your phone number. Then you can proceed with your giving. Another way you can give is by texting Fresh Anointing to 77977. You will receive a link that will take you to our Push Pay platform where you can give. We want to encourage you to share this live stream with your friends and family. Also, tell us in the comment section where you're watching from and how this message is impacting you.